You are listening to the Think Brick Australia podcast. Think Brick Australia represents the clay, brick and paver manufacturers of Australia. Brick by Brick, our podcast will discuss technical information and architectural case studies with special guests. I'm your host, Elizabeth McIntyre, the CEO of Think Brick Australia. On today's podcast, we're very fortunate to have Kathy Inglis, the General Manager, Technical and Innovation for Brickworks, here to discuss with us a very topical subject, embodied carbon and the carbon neutrality of bricks. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you, Elizabeth. It's great to have you here and you've got such a long history in actually being the pioneer with bricks in terms of doing this down in Tasmania. You were the first. We were. We had the first certified carbon neutral brick in the world 10 years ago this year. And they say that we're not advanced, honestly. (laughs) Cathy, let's just take a few steps back. What do we mean by embodied carbon? So embodied carbon is the carbon that's generated through emissions through manufacturing a product for the product stage, then it's right through to delivery of the product and then construction on the building site. So that's the product side. You also have the emissions related to the life of the building, so the energy use over its life and then also the demolition and decommissioning of that building at the end of life. I think that's how we talk about the life cycle of any material, the process of creating the material, how it performs in the building and then what happens when it's no longer used. Yeah, that's right. So that's the stages of the life cycle of a building product, Mm -hmm. the energy that goes into manufacture it, then the use over its life, and then finally it's end of life decommissioning and through to disposal. What is net zero and why is that important? So the energy that goes into make building materials can be quite significant, but we all know that buildings and the construction industry contribute an enormous amount of carbon as a percentage of Australia's greenhouse gases. So there's a certain amount of carbon in the building materials. The rest of it depends how you build the building, what you use over the life of the building. So getting to net zero is not just about making your buildings more energy efficient, reducing your energy use through changing from gas to electric to renewables. It's also about the energy that's in those building materials when they're manufactured. So as the grid is becoming greener with more renewables, the amount of impact of the carbon in the materials is becoming a more significant proportion over the years. So now it's important we concentrate on reducing the carbon that is in our building products from the manufacturing process. And there's all of these other sort of ways that we can also assist carbon neutrality as well. And I know that for architects, a lot of them are sort of leaning more towards brick for a number of reasons, but one of it is because it's locally produced in the transport, Mm. you know. So what are some of the other aspects outside? We're going to get into, I guess, manufacturing of bricks, but what are some of the other aspects of making carbon neutrality for bricks that we can consider? So it's the fuel source used to make the products. So you can look at use of potentially biofuels, substitution fuels, but even potentially changing the processes and making your factories more energy efficient. That's right down to the lighting, the air compressors, anything that uses energy to make those more efficient so it reduces the amount of energy that you consume And the less energy you consume, that reduces the carbon footprint of your product. So the big things are the gas in the kiln and any electricity used in the plant. So electricity can be reduced by renewables Mm -hmm. being used. Yep. Gas is a hard one because there's really no substitute for gas. Gas we brought into brick making years ago to substitute the dirty fuels, Mm -hmm. coal. We used to have oil-fired kilns, coal-fired kilns. So natural gas was a cleaner fuel and a much lower carbon value, but now we need to even get it lower. So we're looking at substitution with other fuels. So they could be fuels that are bio, what we call biofuels Mm. that are made from biomass. So it could be waste organic material that could be used to fuel a kiln or part fuel a kiln or landfill gas that comes out of a landfill site. As landfill decomposes, it generates methane and CO2, that can be captured and collected and used to fuel your kilns. And 
What have they done in Tasmania? What's the fuel that they use there? Tasmania is very special because we're located near the logging industry and they have a lot of waste sawdust. So we fire that kiln on waste sawdust and that kiln was converted about 15 years ago to fully be fired on using the waste sawdust. And what that means is it has virtually no carbon emissions from the firing because we've eliminated the gas for firing. And I love that kiln because I think it's one of the prettiest things to watch because the sawdust dances as as it's firing away. It does. It's fascinating <laughs> to look through the little ports yes. and see the, the sawdust flo- sort of like floating in That's fire. That's right. It's like fire fairies mm. almost. Mm. We've talked around the fuel and the lighting and I guess the energy efficiency, but then what happens with this residual heat, particularly with the sawdust? So, so when you fire a kiln... There's things you can do to reduce the amount of energy. So typically that heat, as you cool down, would just be vented to the atmosphere. We now capture all that heat and use that in our dryers. Mm. So rather than putting fresh heat into fresh energy, I suppose you'd call it, Mm. into fuel the dryers, we capture that heat and use that in the dryers. So that eliminates another source of energy and you take that all off at the end in the cooling zones and pump it into the dryers. So, Cathy, when we're talking about obviously our industry, the brick industry, what does net zero mean? So getting to net zero is a very, very hard thing to do (laughs) up front for any manufacturer, not just the brick industry. Mm. And it's because the technology is not there yet to get us to be net zero straight from in the manufacturing process. However, we can do so many things to get it as low as possible. So that's becoming more energy efficient, looking at alternate fuels, ways to reduce impact on the environment. So that's waste reduction as well, looking at changing fuel sources so getting rid of diesel so you have electric forklifts and other uh, potentially maybe electric trucks to deliver your products one day so those things can reduce the carbon to a certain level there will always be some emissions that you can't get to zero that you have to offset Mm -hmm. so what we do and what we've done at Brickworks at our Longford plant we've got the emissions down as low as practically possible yep and then we offset the last part that we can't so that's the power for the office the cars being driven, the deliveries of bricks to customers, that is all counted and we have to offset that by buying carbon offsets. And what are carbon offsets on that point? (laughs) So carbon offsets are generated by industries that have the ability to absorb carbon by some means. So it could be forestry, reducing land clearing, wind farms, other forms of production or greening the environment that actually reduces carbon. So they generate certificates that can be purchased by third parties to offset our carbon. When you purchase the certificates, does that mean that that enables them to do more of what they're doing? I guess, is that what funds what they do? Yeah, that's correct. So mm. there's a, there's Australian certificates that are called ACUs and yep. then you have international ones as well. And we always try to buy a certain amount of Australian credits to make sure that we're supporting the Australian industry as well and particularly around reforestation and l- preventing land clearing and other things like that where they generate the certificates. So we always make sure we buy a certain amount of those in our offsets. They're also got to be third-party accredited. It's all a very legitimate yes. business. You can't just go and buy offsets from someone that's planted trees. That's no. what I was going to say. You can't just plant a couple of trees in your no, backyard and start selling. You've got to plant an awful lot of them to get a certificate. <laughs> so what does carbon neutrality, I guess, look like when it when we're talking about bricks? What's the roadmap for that? So the roadmap, I think, for the brick industry is one, it's going to take a bit of time. We all know that. Mm. But I think the industry over the last 20 years has already done a lot to reduce emissions. We've already got things in progress. There are kilns already being fired. Well, we've got the one on biomass. Mm. There's other ones with landfill gas. There's also, because we're a local industry, the transport component is lower than products that are travelling a long distance. They all go into the mix and... The efficiencies of modern plants now compared to the plants that were run 
30, 40, 50 years ago is incredibly, it's improved a lot so that that reduces the amount of energy in the process as well. And a lot of that we've self-regulated and we actually haven't really been given a lot of credit for it, you know, when sort of a lot of politicians come out with these targets. One of the things that we've seen such a big rise in is the passion for recycled bricks by the by architects and builders and specifiers and that's driven by what how consumers want a brick to look like. That's one of the unique properties I think of bricks is that as you know they can be reused again and again. They can but they also have such a long life before that. I mean we know there's brick buildings that have been standing for thousands of years Mm. so typically when you build a structure the most sustainable building is one that's there for a very long time that has very little maintenance and that if and when it is demolished, that those products can actually be firstly reused, but if they can't be reused and they go to landfill, that they're inert and have no long-term impacts. So bricks are the perfect product for that because they can be reused with their full properties intact into another project at the end of the life of that one building and move into another life. And we see that and I think I may have mentioned to you, I think at one point it was more expensive to buy a recycled brick than it was to actually purchase a newly manufactured one. It can happen because they've got to be collected and the mortar's got to be cleaned off them and so they can be reused. But that's the beauty of them, that they can actually be reused with all their structural properties intact. There's not a lot of other products. Exactly. If you demolish a building that you actually have those products with their properties intact. You can use them for other things, like you can crush concrete and use it as gravel or as a fill or as other materials, but you can't use it as its structural That's purpose. Right. Yep. Bricks you can. Yep. So, Cathy, we spoke about Longford in Tasmania, but do carbon neutral bricks exist? They certainly do. So the, all the bricks out of our Tasmanian operation at Longford are carbon neutral. There are also now options for other plants around Australia that have carbon neutral bricks as well. So it's, I suppose it's a growing market, you'd call it. Yes. And I think going forward, there's going to be more and more opportunities for low carbon bricks and no carbon bricks. I like that. So Cathy, you're right. Carbon neutral bricks do exist. And some of the manufacturers that have jumped on board with this have our Austral Bricks, Daniel Robertson and Krauss Bricks. And they're all offering full carbon neutrality on every order across a whole different range of products. That's correct. And it's great to see that that you now have a selection you can choose from. That means you can get local bricks as well. So not just bricks from Tasmania. That's right. You can now pick your local bricks for your project and have carbon neutral bricks. In the state you're living. That's correct. So just to quickly recap, thank you for, I guess, explaining so simply embodied carbon, why net zero is important, how the brick industry can reduce the embodied carbon in our bricks how we manufacture and then some of the other things that we can do to take that that little bit further. Thank you for taking us through the pathway for net zero for the brick industry but also reinforcing the resilience of bricks as a building material and the longevity of their lifespan and how, as you rightly said, they maintain their structural integrity even when they're used again and again. Thank you. And as everyone likes to know, I like to do something else while I'm listening to podcasts. So all of this information will be very easily accessible on our show notes. Thank you, Kathy, for joining us today. Thank you, Elizabeth. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please follow, rate and review our podcast. We are always looking for new ways to think brick. If you have an idea of what you'd like to hear about, there's a link in our show notes to let us know.